Well, I think that's certainly the case because in a sense in terms of ideology, they are a stronger force. They will push just as the LTT was a stronger force in comparison with the UNP. And Rani Vikramasinghe didn't have the capacity to get the strength of the UNP. You know, in 2002, it would have been Karu Jayasure, Gamini Atakorala, who unfortunately died. Uh, then people of, let us say, tremendous uh, intellectual capacity, like GLP Iris, uh, were not really given their due position. My own minister, Mahindra Samrasinghe. You know, these are people who could have played a greater role and who would have helped him to control the, uh, the LTT. Similarly, I don't think he'll be able to control this campaign, but having said that, one has to hope that what you would call the 20% bedrock of UNP support will return to the UNP after the presidential election and at least make sure that it becomes the major opposition party. So is uh, UNP trying to commit Haragiri? Oh, I don't think the UNP will do that, but under its present constitution, it will have to obviously follow its leader and its leader had decided that you know he couldn't contest the presidential election so why not have a substitute uh, you were uh, the president of or the chairman of the liberal party and then you also contested the presidential elections so what made you give this up well in 2007 before i was asked to join the peace secretariat i thought i've been leader of the liberal party for 10 years and that's a long time especially because i had no electoral success to show for it you know we had one or two members in places and i think you know i have always thought the party yeah. is more an intellectual think tank that yes. was why i joined it i'm not really a good <laughs> politician uh, but i felt 10 years was enough so i gave up the general secretary of the party to go over as leader in fact, oddly enough, he asked me later, did you yeah. give it up because you were going to find a peace secretary? I said, I had, no, not at all. I gave up in April. It was at the end of May that I got a sudden telephone call. Uh, but, of course, the present uh, leadership of the Liberal Party have asked me to continue as their international affairs person. And, in fact, they've also asked me to take over as chairman of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats because Sri Lanka is going to be the chair party from, well, it is the chair party now, in fact, but the former individual and over will take place a bit later. And I think that's very important because we are also one of the first Asians to have joined Liberal International. Chana Kamratunga's capacity for understanding liberal thought and its applicability to Asia was massive. You know, he's highly respected everywhere. And so not a lot of people we know are now fairly influential. For instance, the Trade Commissioner is a very nice Swedish lady uh, who is a liberal. And I think that may actually help us to convince the liberals in Europe. Um, the new head of yeah. Liberal International is a Dutchman. And you had the, the former <coughs> foreign minister of Thailand, I think. I forget the present foreign minister of Thailand, who's a marvelous character. Yeah. No, the, the uh, Democrats of Thailand are perhaps yeah. the strongest party in Kerala. So I think that will actually help to give a better impression yeah. of Sri Lanka's image in countries that sometimes have not yeah. got the right idea. Moving on to your subject, Rajiv, what is the situation in the I IDP camps? Well, the IDP camps really have been, I think, a success story in the sense that 280,000 people came, rather surprisingly. We were not expecting so many, let me be honest. I thought there were fewer going on the figures of uh, the food that had been supplied earlier, etc. Uh, and the numbers that we got from the UN because this had been tracked. Of course, in 2007, I'd asked them to get more precision on the figures. But this large number came up. We look after them extremely well, with a lot of help from the UN. You know, UNHCR, IOM, and especially the World Food Programme did a fantastic job. Uh, and these people were looked after. Uh, the shelter was put up. There were few problems with toilets. Some you know, NGOs had not followed Sri Lankan standards on toilets. As I keep saying, they don't understand the importance of water. Yeah. You know, there was an idiot who thought you could build boxes mm. of plywood. And when I told him, you know, you can't do this. Fortunately, some Sri Lankan NGOs pointed out the Sri Lankan standards. But that was a bit of an aberration. And all the people worried. You know, every month, the Prophet of Doom would say, an epidemic yes. will broke out next month. It hasn't happened yet. Tribute to our Ministry of Health, which is one of the most capable, both in this country and internationally. No epidemics at all. Malnutrition standards, which were long-term malnutrition. I checked. It wasn't caused by the last six months. It was caused by two or three years 
of the tigers not giving the people the food. You know, we now yeah. know that a lot of the food we g gave was creamed off. In fact, the Americans asked me, because they paid for a lot of it, they said, you mean the UN, the UN uh, trucks were taken by the tigers? I said, of course. I mean, the people up there knew they had to survive with this monstrous group of people who just took all the food. The, the but the malnutrition improved. The death statistics, you know, some papers say so many are dead, the death statistics uh, were a bit higher than average in the first 10 days. After that, they came down. So I think that was great. The second point we made, and government said we are not being dragooned into rapid resettlement. We had three reasons. One, and most important, demining. We must make sure that there's no risk. We can't demine completely. Secondly, we must give some basic infrastructure. And on that, agencies like the World Bank, the ADB, have been magnificent. Because they also realize that sometimes, you know, terrorist groups spring up because of economic deprivation. And of course, in this country, the periphery was neglected. Not only the north and east, but the south, the uh, Monragala district, Polonnaru, Markale sections, you should know that. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is that until President Rajapaksa, you never had an elected leader of this country who was from born outside the Western province. So, you know, you now have someone who understands that in order to have peace and prosperity, you have to develop equally. Now, as a result, infrastructure has begun in the north much better. The east, you know, you look at it. Every time I go, I'm just astonished at how speedily they've developed. But we must also develop human resources. Government has plans for this because the people of those parts must become the leaders of economic development in such parts. The third factor was security. We said we cannot let people out while the tigers are there. Until May, we were really very worried because while Prabhakaran and Potuaman, etc. were still active, we ha it was a risk. Yeah. After May, things eased off, but still then, internationally, there was an attempt to revive the Tigers. One European country actually told us, now that Prabhakaran is dead, talk to Mr. Patmanathan, as though he's a straight political leader. Actually, the ambassador of that country apologized to me, the ambassador here who understands the situation better. He said that was a mistake. But this was the message the LTT was spreading abroad. So we still had to be careful in case terror revived. But after thorough checking, and we took a bit longer than perhaps was ideal, but it was thorough. We have released, anybody can leave the camps. And in fact, many people said they have nowhere to go. You know, unlike earlier when we said they're dying to go. 90,000 are still waiting there, though they're eligible to go. Only about 30,000, I think, have gone. 10,000 of those came back. So you have a situation where the people can go in and out. The people who are resettled are, I think, doing extremely well. This is a quicker program than anywhere else. One thing that really made me happy when I was there, you know, I can tell you it's good, yeah. someone else can tell you it's bad, but uh, I didn't look at yeah. everything. But you know, there was this family, it was a man who'd gone from Colombo in 1983. You know, we have to realize that many people there, you see, the Norwegians yes. were accused of settling people of the Indian Tamil community in the Vanni. Certainly there was a lot of settlement there, but you have to realize those people and Colombo Tamil suffered in 1981, in 1983, because of programs that elements in the Jayawardena the government unleashed on. Yes. Now this man, you know, a nice old man now, seven children, all with him, he has started a boutique. And you know, he's not going to buy packets of tipiti yeah. if people are not going to buy it. So that to me is evidence that there is a very positive mindset amongst these people, that they can have economic activity, they can have their own entrepreneurship, one of the problems in the 70s is that because we had a very statist approach to government, when government couldn't do enough for people, they tended to do it for people who were their vote bank, and particularly the Tamils of the North, who are wonderfully entrepreneurial people, had no opportunity for entrepreneurship. This government is determined to ensure a proper place for such activity, which will involve training. So we're trying to do this. I think we've done a very good job with the IDP camps. And, you know, it's not ideal, but compared with anywhere else in the world. I mean, the UN officials who have come from places where there's been real suffering have told us, you know, this is extraordinary.